Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can hear the brush of angel wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this. Would you stand and sing that with us? Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can hear the brush of angel wings. I see glory on each face. Oh, surely, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Amen and amen. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10, Beginning in verse 23. Now when he got into a boat, his disciples followed him. And suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea, so that the boat was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. Then his disciples came to him and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. But he said to them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds, and calmed the sea, and there was a great calm. So the men marveled, saying, Who can this be that even the winds and the sea obey him? You ever feel like you're in a storm? Like you're in a tempest? There's a song that I remember, The Peacekeeper, Jesus Christ, can calm even the winds and the sea. He is the peacekeeper. And we rejoice today that that is our God, that is our Lord, that we serve, that in the midst of whatever storms may come into our life, physical, emotional, financially, whatever it may be, the peacekeeper is at our side. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the great privilege that we have to open your word and for you to speak to us and for us to fellowship with this music and with song and with our friends and family. We pray you bless this time in a mighty way. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you for being here today. If you're here for the very first time, if you would look uh, in that pew directly in front of you, the back part of that pew, pew you will find, a, I hope, a guest card. Fill that out. When you leave in a few moments, uh, you can drop that in the kiosk as you exit the building. They're located around the hallways at the exit doors. And we'll have a record of your visit, and we would appreciate that uh, very much. Thank you for being here today. We hope that uh, this, is, this will be a, a wonderful day in God's house to worship and to fellowship with one another. We have some announcements that we need to hear. Well, good morning. Um, thank you all for praying for this last week. Um, we took 15 students down to Houston and four adults um, and served in Houston or the Katy, Texas area. Um, did a lot of interesting jobs. Um, some of the students um, learned that they can actually work harder than they thought they could and sweat more than they thought they could. And I'll stop there because that's just nasty. Uh, so. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you um, for your support. And I want to give you a quick little view of our week. Um, things were done from roofing to just pretty much demoing whole insides of a house to trying to get it back together, building a 160 foot deck. There were lots of things that were done. But here's a short video for y'all.
That looked like a fun place to be all outside in that humidity. But uh, I believe they had a great time. God blessed them on that effort. And thank y'all youth for going and being a participants in that and uh, learning a lot as you win. Uh, just a couple of announcements. Next Sunday morning, we'll have our Sunday school and church. Uh, and then we'll have church right in here at uh, normal time. And after we have church worship in here next Sunday morning, we'll be going to the Richardson building where we'll have hot dogs and hamburgers. So uh, we're celebrating the 4th of July in that sort of way. So we encourage you to all bring friends with you next Sunday as we celebrate the 4th of July. Also, the RAs uh, will be going to camp uh, July 9th through 12th, and they are still needing shampoo and conditioners uh, for the camp to be able to bring, and they'll be giving those away to needy folks. But uh, they need plenty of four-ounce shampoo and conditioners. So if you can help us out with that, you, know, you can put those things over here in the Welcome Center. And then uh, just a reminder to our Building Grounds Committee meeting uh, this afternoon at 4 o'clock, we'll be back here in the conference room for those that are on that committee. Brother Martin. We have some job openings uh, available if some of you might feel led in that way. We've got a, we, we have lost a few folks working with our sound and lighting and video uh, stuff. Used to in the old auditorium, it took one person could run all of it. Now it takes four uh, to do all of that. We can give you some training. If, you felt, if you've ever felt like, you know, that looks like it'd be a lot of fun and you can sit up in the balcony and, you know, hide behind computer screens uh, and those kind of things. But if you would like to be a part of that, be a part of that ministry, if you would see me, see Wayne Briggs, uh, we, would be, we would love to have you come be a part uh, of our audiovisual tech stuff uh, here at the church. Let's sing together. Just a, a series and a, a time of hymns. I love the great old hymns. You know that. The way they touch lives and hearts. Beginning with hymn 463. Let's sing together. Rock of Ages. Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let go.
cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rock and cross and exchange it someday for go on as I just looked across the congregation. I just happened to see Brother James Keith sitting here. Brother James, welcome back. It is so, so good to see you. James has been battling cancer and, and going through some things, and he's been missed us for a long, long time. It's so good to have you back with us. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder Consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder. Thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul. Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Would you stand and sing that last verse? When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, oh my God, how great thou art. And sings my soul, yes. my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Be seated if you would, please. I could take you to a harbor with freedom's torture blaze. Or a blue Pacific island where a tattered flag was raised. I could take you to a rolling grassy field where rows of markers speak of sacrifice. I could take you to where the towers fell To, to the, the echoes of a thousand last I love yous and goodbyes And I'm sure that you'd be moved to tears By the weight of what you saw You'd view those acts of courage and could only stand in awe. And I know that you would think you've seen a picture of true love. 
But if you want to see it all, let me take you to the cross. So let me take you to a hillside, a scene you won't forget. See a man who agonizes with the cost of every breath. Come and touch the nails that pierce his feet and hands. Watch him as he fights to see it through. Though the reasons are hard to understand If you dare to stay there long enough To know it was for you And I'm sure that you'd be moved to tears By the weight of what you saw you view those acts of courage and could only stand in awe. Only then could you declare a picture of true love. So if you want to see it all, let me take you to the cross. and filled your emptiness inside There's no other place where you can go to find eternal life And I'm sure that you'd be moved to tears by the weight of what you saw You see those acts of courage and could only stand in awe And I know that you would think you've seen A picture of true love But if you want to see it all Let me take you to the cross people said amen. amen thank you so very much I ask you to take your Bibles with me today we'll go to the book of the Revelation one more time we've been doing a series of sermons on Sunday morning out of the book of Revelation entitled the seven churches of the Revelation we've been looking at each one of these churches and what the message was to that particular church, and more specifically what the message was to those Christians, those new Christians that were in those churches. We said early on that most Bible scholars are convinced that there are seven church ages. 
And they also agree that each one of these seven churches represent a particular church age. We've not spent that time on those church ages during our messages because it can get rather uh, long in explaining that church age and how it applies to that particular church. One thing was true about all of these churches was that each message to each church can apply to every church, every believer, in every church age. As we come to this last church today in Revelation chapter 3, we're going to be looking at the church at Laodicea. And as we listen and look at those, those scholars of Revelation, they look at Laodicea as being the, the, the church that represents the last church age just prior to the rapture of the church, the first part of the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so if we were to take that application from those theologians, we would understand that, that we are living in the church of this particular age, the last church age prior to the return of Jesus Christ, the age of the church at Laodicea. And as we look at this particular outline, we will do as we've been able to do each week as we see some specific things that Jesus had to say to the churches. And as he spoke to the church at Laodicea in verse 14, he said, I am the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, in chapter three, verse 14. He speaks about himself as he opens up this, this stark letter to the church at Laodicea. This is the church that was lukewarm. And we find here as we begin to go through this outline, we see first of all, the compliments to the church. Sadly, we find no compliments to the church at Laodicea. That is a stark reminder that to this church of the last church age, we are in desperate need of being what God wants us to be. Amen. We're in desperate need of some things that he's going to reveal to the church at Laodicea. As we look, we see also uh, in the first part of verse 15, in the first part of 15, or the second part of verse 15, he says, I know your works. Now here are their works. In some of the other letters, I know your works, your faith, your patience, your love. He's mentioned works as a way of complimenting the church. But notice how he phrases these words of, that he calls, I know your works. He says, I know your works, that you're neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. Here's the concern that he has for the church at Laodicea. They are neither cold and they're not hot. They're not cold in their response to the Lord. They're not cold in their witness. They're not cold in uh, their work for the Lord. They're not cold in their faithfulness to their church, but neither are they hot. They're not they're not hot. They, they're not zealous about their Lord. They're not zealous about their church. They're not zealous about what God may be asking them to do as individual Christians. He said, I know your works. Unfortunately, he does not go through and say, I know your works of your love and your patience, your labor. I know where you live. I know the, that you're amidst the synagogue of Satan. He doesn't go into those things that we've seen in prior letters. He just says, I know your works, and here are your works. He says, you're not, you're not cold, you're not hot. And then Jesus says something 
uh, very interesting to that church at Laodicea, to those Christians at Laodicea. He says there in verse 15, I could, I could wish that you were one or the other. I wish you were either cold or hot. Jesus is saying, I wish you were anything but in the middle. I wish you were anything but lukewarm. And we find here his caution to the church in verse 16. His concern for the church was they're neither hot nor cold. I could wish you were cold or hot. And then we see the, his caution to the church in verse 16. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. As we look at these verses, verse 16 and verse 17, we see his caution to the church. His concern was, you're not hot, you're not cold, you're in your comfort zone. You're lukewarm. What does it mean to be in our comfort zone? It means that we have found a comfortable place in our religion. We have found a comfortable place in our relationship to Jesus Christ. We found a comfortable place in our church. We have found a comfortable place in our service. And we can call that our comfort zone. I feel comfortable in doing this, but I don't feel too comfortable in doing that. It's a comfort zone. And it draws us into this position of being lukewarm. I'm not really cold, and I'm not really hot. I'm really not zealous, but I'm just kind of in the comfort zone of being lukewarm one of our first trips to Honduras uh, the particular airport that we were flying into did not have uh, the the nice ramps like you have up here in DFW or the other major airports where you the airplane taxis in and stops in this uh, automated, automated ramp comes out and snuggles up against the airplane and you exit out that ramp into the terminal. You, they open the, open the door of the airplane and there's a big long ladder uh, steps that you walk down onto the tarmac and then you, you find your way on into the terminal. And when they open that door, and I was standing in that door waiting for others to go down that step. I looked out at a third world country and a third world airport. And parked over here on the side of the terminal was an airplane that had crashed at the airport. And they just moved it off the, moved it off the runway and waited on the next one to crash. And they'd, they'd stack them up everywhere when they crashed. And I stopped and I, we got on, got out of an air conditioned airplane. I was standing on that ramp fixing to go down. It was about 110 degrees in Honduras. And I stopped and I looked around and I said to myself, I thought where nobody could hear me, what have I gotten myself into? And Deborah standing behind me being the good, good wife that she is, said, get over it and go on. All of a sudden, we were out of our comfort zone. And we, we, we get that. We find those places where we're comfortable. And we call them our comfort zone. And we're almost in that place of being lukewarm. He reads his caution to the church in verse 16 and verse 17. In verse 16, he gives his verdict. And it's a stern verdict. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. 
These are some of the most distasteful words that we've heard Jesus Christ say. I will vomit. I will remove you from myself and I will be removed from you. I want nothing to do with you. Because you're neither cold nor hot, you are just lukewarm. And if you've ever tried a lukewarm drink, you know what that tastes like. Oftentimes I've been into a restaurant and, and ordered iced tea, and the iced tea was just brewed a few moments ago. Though it has ice in it, it is lukewarm. And iced tea for East Texas is with ice, amen? <laughs> that's why we call it iced tea. So there is something distasteful about this lukewarm condition, this spiritual condition. He talked about verse 17, the first part of verse 17, about their boldness. Look what they are saying about themselves. Because you say, I'm rich. I have become wealthy. And I have need of nothing. There's their boldness. When they reviewed their own status before the Lord, this was how they would respond to him. I'm rich. I'm wealthy. I have need of nothing. And so we find ourselves sometimes in that lukewarm position, that lukewarm condition where we say, I've got what I need. I, I, my kids are saved. My grandkids are saved. I, I've got a nice church building. I, I, I like this Sunday school class. I like that Sunday school class. I, I, I like this about our church. I like that about our church. And we find ourselves in this comfortable zone saying, I need nothing. I've got everything just like I want it. And Jesus says, he shows them their blindness in that same verse 17. And here is their blindness. And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. That was their blindness. They saw themselves as rich, as wealthy, and needing nothing. And if we are truly are in the, this last church age, there has never been this much wealth and riches in the world than there is in this age. There is wealth and riches in this world that just, we hear that there are people that are worth billions of dollars. That these tech giants are worth literally billions of dollars. We, most of us cannot comprehend that in our mind to think about the wealth and the riches that is in this world. And we have, as the United States, we have been referred to as the wealthiest nation on the planet. And we might very well say as a nation, we have need of nothing. But when Jesus Christ looks at the United States of America today, he may very well say, but you do not know that you are poor and blind and wretched to the core because of where we are as a nation and what happens in our nation and how we are changing fundamental beliefs in America and how we are changing the foundation of the Judeo-Christian life in America. When we accept abortion as nothing but just another day in the field. To take a baby's life and snuff it out before it ever has a chance and call it the right to health. And when we take the, the sex of a of a human being, the sex of a male and a female. And we pass a law that it's okay for that male to feel female. And because he feels female, he can walk in a restroom or a, or a 
a, an area at a high school where young girls are dressing and showering after PE and he can walk in because he says he feels female and we make it okay. We pass a law and say he can do that and pass a law and males that claim to be feel female can now, can now align themselves with the sports of a female. There is something corrupt in our, in our nation that we're missing. We have come to a point in our nation where we are neither hot nor cold about God. We are lukewarm. He's okay if we just leave him alone. We're okay if we just leave him alone. We are in this, we may very well be in this last church age where we have become lukewarm just before the second coming of Jesus Christ. And we wonder when that's going to be. And no one, no one, even though there are those that call themselves prophets, will claim that he's coming this day or that day or this year or that year. They do not know. Jesus said, I don't know. Jesus said, the angels don't know. There's only one that knows. God the Father knows. And one day, friend, when this world is so wretched as it is, God's going to turn to Jesus sitting at the right hand of his throne, and he's going to say, go bring my children home. Amen. And he's going to appear in the eastern sky. Let's not either be hot or cold that he'll vomit us out of our mouth. Matthew chapter 7 says on that day, there'll be some that are left behind. That rapture will take place according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and he will rapture the church. Those who believe in him, he will rapture that church. And the Bible says that the dead in Christ will rise first. Just before the church is raptured, the dead in Christ in those graves are going to come forth. He's going to resurrect the dead. He's going to rapture the living. In Matthew chapter 7, some will be left behind and they're going to be crying, Lord, look at me. Remember me? I did this. I did that for you. I preached for you. I healed people for you. I went on mission trips for you. I sang for you. I tithed to you. I did all of this for you. And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. It's not about works. It is about a gift of God that is grace. That when we were yet sinners, he died for us. We see clearly his verdict. We see their boldness. We have need of nothing. And we see their blindness. He says, you don't even recognize how poor and wretched and blind you really are. We see his counsel to the church threefold. Verse 18, trade their riches for his righteousness. Trade their riches for his righteousness. The first part of verse 18. I counsel you to buy from me, gold refined in the fire. When we read that phrase together, gold refined in the fire, it's usually related to our faith. Because our faith is refined under intense pressure. We're better. Our faith becomes stronger when we're under intense pressure. He also says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich not in rich in wealth, but rich in faith. He also says white garments. You can buy white garments. Laodicea was known for its garment district where garments were made. But here he says white garments. White is a symbol of the holiness. And he comes through Jesus Christ. Trade their riches for his righteousness. Verse 18, the second part, trade their blindness for his revelations. Verse 18, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. 
And then he says, trade, trade their blindness for his revelations. There was, he says, take eye There was a medical school in Laodicea. They specialized in blindness. They specialized in eye problems. They created an eye salve that could be put on blindness that would help blind people. And he would, he would say, I right, go get some of that eye salve and put it on your spiritual eyes that you may see. His counsel to the church, trade their riches for his righteousness, their blindness for their revelations, trade his rebuke for spiritual revival. Verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke. He loves us. He cares for us. The book of Hebrews says that, that he, he does not chastise those who he does not love, but he chastises those whom he loves. And he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. His last counsel, as it always been in every one of these letters, is in verse 22. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. And then as we close this particular letter, we look at verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He waits at the door of the church. He waits at the door of our hearts that we might overcome this lukewarmness when we find ourselves there. When we find in our, ourselves there when we're not hot, we're not cold, we're just kind of lukewarm. We're comfortable with our Christianity. We don't step out and get in that, that uncomfortable zone where we might be witnessing, where we might be teaching, going on that mission trip, working in vacation Bible school. But we find our comfort zone in that most comfortable pew. As Mark said a moment ago, one that can hide behind those monitors up there. You can hide from the preacher. You can't hide from the Holy Spirit. There's no way. To he who overcomes, he has rewards waiting for him in heaven. Have you ever been lukewarm? Not hot, not cold, but in that good, soft comfort zone. Maybe today you might say, you know what? As I look around at my life, I am, I am kind of lukewarm about God. I'm kind of lukewarm about Jesus. I'm kind of lukewarm about the church. I hear that they need people to work in these places. I hear they need teachers. I hear they need these people over here to help in this area. I hear that they need, need workers with children in the nursery and Sunday school in different places, but I'm really comfortable right where I am. It may be in your heart today that you feel that lukewarmness. I'm not really hot, and I'm not really cold. I have found that comfortable place. And sometimes we can sit, listen, Sometimes we can find ourselves in that comfort zone too long. And Jesus said, if you don't overcome, I will remove the church, your church. I will take it away. We need to be careful that we don't in the lukewarm area too long.